To celebrate the International Day for Universal Access to Information, join UNESCO in affirming and reiterating the urgency to respect and maintain the right to information, especially amid the COVID-19 outbreak. In times of emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to protect the right to access information so that Communities can protect themselves and their families. Journalists debunk the falsehoods and report the facts about the disease. Scientists and policymakers provide us with directives and guidance on how to cope with the pandemic. Citizens can know the measures to prevent and mitigate the risks. That's why we need public information without delay with strong and effective institutions to keep citizens informed. Access to information is not a burden, but a right that needs to be supported by law. And any restrictions to this right should conform to the law, be proportionate and limited to protect the citizens. Join our high-level webinar on 28 September and all the online events across the world that UNESCO and partners are organizing to celebrate our right to access information. Go to our website for more information. Access to information. Saving lives, building trust, bringing hope. Good morning, good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Um, on 17th November 2015, UNESCO's member states adopted Resolution 38C-70, declaring 28th of September of every year as the International Day for Universal Access to Information. On 15th October 2019, Resolution 74-5, adopted by the UN General Assembly, proclaimed this day and invited its stakeholders to celebrate the day by recognizing that access to information can play a crucial role in paving our way to a sustainable world, um, um, democracy, equality, and the delivery of public services. Access to scientific information also has been in the heart of this resolution and its subsequent proclamation. Ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has put the context and significance of open access to scientific information in a significant limelight. Consequently, all stakeholders from government to academic institutions have reaffirmed the value and necessity of open access to deal with the present crisis. It has issued the call for opening scholarships and sciences to democratize knowledge of the public, to facilitate research to inform health responses and create an unrestricted mechanism to share research outcomes and data. This webinar, Opening Science for, uh, for Building Resilience in the Face of COVID-19, will debate on the same, the value, significance, and innovations in democratization of scientific knowledge in the past 20 years, and perhaps pave the way forward for coming days. The webinar will be about how can open access save lives, build trust, and bring hope to 7.8 billion of us hit by the pandemic and face its consequences. We have gathered today a very formidable panel to discuss these issues. Please don't forget to partake in the debate and uh, please use the chat box to key in your actual observation and comments. A few of them will be included in our contribution to, this, uh, to the Chief Executive Board's document and will also feature in our view in our news release. Kindly spare a few minutes to participate in a short survey which will appear at the end of the webinar. To moderate today's discussion, I would like to invite Professor Jean-Claude Guedon. You may all know Professor Guedon as an emeritus professor from the University um, of Montreal or as an alumni of University of Wisconsin-Madison, whose teaching career has taken him to fine institutions such as John Hopkins University, Université de Pasteur, École des Sartes, uh, Université Lyon II, University of Sao Paulo, University of um, Amsterdam, Politecnico of Turin to nephew. He is also a person with several distinctions. He was one of the laureates of uh, Charles Yale International Prize for Francophony in 1996. He was named Joseph Letter Medical Library Association Lecturer for the 100th anniversary uh, of MLA. Flecklo at the Baum Center for Arts in 2002 and 2003. He had chaired numerous advisory boards, expert groups, think tanks, fellowships. 
Most notably, he was one of the architects of the Budapest Open Access Initiative. He's one of the most renowned active advocates of open access. He has three books and about 140 other publications to his credit. Professor Gadon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Banu. You said way too much about me. I'm going to hide now uh, after such an introduction, but thank you very, very much. Let me uh, greet everybody that is listening on today to this International Day for Universal Access to Information. And what I've tried to do before leaving the floor to my very good colleagues is to paint a very quick backdrop um, um, situation for, the, for the, the doing of science and open access within it. I've long be believed that humanity really is bootstrapping itself in terms of knowledge by moving towards from discrete brains, what we are ourselves, uh, individuals, uh, towards some sort of a world brain to use the well-known image um, that was publicized by H.G. Wells. I also think that knowledge, unlike other forms of expression of, let's say, beliefs, uh, is always an endless work in progress. Uh, with, with, the, with the science, you never get a final answer. You have the best possible answer that people have been able to come up with. And the only way to make all this proceed is by what I call an endless conversation. A, a limitless debate. And that's why I think it's a form of bootstrapping for humanity. And this immediately leads to interesting consequences. How do you, how would you do? What would you do to impede knowledge? And I answer it's quite easy, unhappily. You can limit the number of people that can intervene in that conversation. You can limit the conversation by limiting access to prior conversations, that is access to for example, the publications, you can limit the number of questions that can be raised. So in the result of all this is that knowledge can be distorted. It can, be, it can lead to what has been called epistemic injustice. And that has to be taken into account if we want to think of what COVID-19 is helping us realize so urgently. Next. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm not having the next slide. I don't know why. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, do you have the slide? I have my own, but do you have yours? Um, the problem with the present system of scientific communication is that it is strongly shaped uh, and almost exclusively shaped by competition rather than cooperation. Scholarly and scientific competition has been managed furthermore through uh, journal rankings rather than direct evaluation of research results. And the rankings refer to really very contested intellectual dimensions. It can refer to visibility, to prestige, authority, etc. And yet they play a, a crucial role in researcher competitions for resources, let's call that quickly career man management. So what you have in effect is a world which disciplines researchers in a very peculiar way to that competition of access to journal publishing. Only some journals in the world are ranked and they are ranked by com commercial entities. And the rankings also play a commercial role. <clears throat> in other words, this competition also has to do with market shares, it has to do with negotiations between publishers and libraries. And this leads to, to two conclusions which must be kept in mind. Researchers, because of this situation, tend to shape their publication strategy and ultimately their research program to fit with journal competition. This leads to neglecting problems, some of which are of enormous importance. And we can go back to that later on, talking about the coronavirus. Second conclusion, open science and open access attempt to correct the situation generally by improving access. 
Now let's see what can be done through that particular avenue. Next, please. So access appears to be the fundamental issue, but access to what? We generally think of it as access to be able to read uh, the, uh, the things that have been published in science, but how about access to writing? How about access to shaping the research programs as has been done with some research, research funding agencies that try to respond to the needs of the public? Other forms of access, which may not, uh, are not so obvious as the ones that you think about with journals or even books. For example, the way people correspond with each other, uh, the conferences you attend or not attend, and so on. Next slide, please. So what we am talking about is that with the kind of access that you open up, you really shape the kind of science you want. And what kind of science do we want? It seems to me that the science we want, at the, at the least, at the very, very least, should respond to human needs and wants. And it should, uh, uh, it should not be one that just adjusts and responds to a particular form of competition, in this case, journal competition. So then the next slide, please. So COVID-19 is acting really like a litmus test for the humanities model of knowledge creation. And it has revealed a number of, of dimensions which are really quite interesting. It has revealed a remarkable capacity to mobilize resources and efforts to control the pandemic. That is true. People have focused on this very, very quickly. But it has also revealed extremely short-sighted and selfish objectives. Countries saying that they will do the stuff for themselves, that they will treat their countries first. Uh, we know about the United States essentially um, be, be, be demeaning WHO for, for not doing what it should have done in order to protect the United States when we know that the problems in the US came from other sources and, and so on. It has also revealed the long neglect of whole areas of research, for example, in coronavirus. We had alerts before this year uh, with this kind of viruses. SARS was in 2004, MERS 2012. Luckily, so far, we have a lethal but not extraordinary lethal um, uh, coronavirus as MERS is, uh, but imagine the, the transmission, transmissibility of, of MERS being equal to COVID-19 with its lethality, and you'd have hundreds of millions of people dying. So you, you, you really have areas which have to be studied, which have not been studied well. And one has to ask, why is it so? How could we be so neglectful that uh, we, we, uh, we uh, missed all that? So by implication, uh, it also points to other long neglected uh, uh, um, areas that we have to look at. And again, we have uh, we had alarm alarm sirens that uh, rang off rather quickly. Remember uh, how long it took to start paying attention to Zika, to Ebola, and of course we could even all, go all the way back to malaria, which still kills hundreds of thousands of people a year, and which has been vaguely treated at a distance until recently when the Gates Foundation finally began to uh, do something about it. So now I would like, with this kind of backdrop in place, I would like to sort of cast or throw a challenge to the members of, the, of, the, of this panel. And we have some extremely good members in this panel. So I'm taking advantage of this meeting to do so. For example, we'll start with Rob Terry and we'll ask him to, uh, to uh, help understand what forms of access funding agencies can favor or support. And a little bit further down the line uh, in position four, Johan Rorick, uh, I would like him to address that question too beside what he wants to address. Could Samia Kafi Kadu from the Tunisian government uh, enlighten us 
on how governments in their fight against a global sanitary menace can strive to protect their national constituencies while fully cooperating with other countries. Tanabel and Ariana, who both are at the head and, and organizing and managing very important platforms, can they tell us what platforms and the, the coming up of platform bring up in terms of, um, in, you know, the, 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 how to mitigate the issues with the competition between journals and perhaps in that fashion, correct epistemic injustice and correct the neglect of scientific, important scientific problems. And finally, Glenn Hampson asked us to be able to give us a synthetic view of the discussion. And I would like to have him indeed uh, how uh, open access could be aligned in order to really bring about the, the best tools of scholarly communication with the needs of knowledge construction in favor of humanity. So this is a lot of work to do in the next few minutes. Each speaker has five to six minutes to try and fill such large questions plus others they want to bring up. But I will ask them to be very disciplined to do that exactly in, in, within those limits. Many thanks. So we can have perhaps now Rob starting uh, his intervention since. Okay, thank you, John Claude. That was very good. And uh, if we can just bring up the slides and I'll start. So my name is Rob Terry. I work as a, a manager of research policy for TDR, uh, which is the uh, tropical research and training, um, research and training in tropical diseases, a uh, pro special program based within WHO. We're also co uh, sponsored by UNICEF, UNDP, the, and the World Bank. So the next slide, please. So what I would like to quickly do is just to understand what we mean by open science and where it fits within the research cycle. And I would say there are three main areas. It's in the inputs, the outputs, and the impact. So on the inputs, what we really need to know to have the best possible public health agenda is where is research occurring? Who's funding it? What are they doing? Uh, and how is that moving forward? If we are to have any real hope of providing any kind of coordination, particularly at a global level, and because no matter how much resource we have, it'll never be enough. We need to be certain that we're making the right priorities. The outputs, yes, publish. Everything should be published. And I think one of the problems we have in the current system, in a subscription-based system, is it doesn't really encourage the publication of negative results, blind alleys, and those types of things. We definitely need to move towards almost 100% open access. All clinical trials must be registered. And when they're registered and completed, their data must be shared. And I'll talk more about data sharing later, but it's really, really important that data is shared. And we need all that information if all of this evidence is going to have an impact on policy. And that's really the real objective, particularly uh, in the life sciences and medical sciences. We need to be able to identify quality uh, research. We need to be able to aggregate and synthesize that. And if we can put that together, if we can stick to the science, then we will have an impact uh, on policy and behavior. If we move to the next slide, you'll actually see just how big uh, the agenda is for open science. It's not just publications, it's not just data, it's every single element of the research process. It's the research protocols, it's what funders are doing, it's open repositories, it's open services. And so we need to have all of that in place so that we can actually really move forward and democratize science. I think it's very important actually to just remind ourselves what open access is. And I was right there at the beginning uh, working for Wellcome Trust in 2000 when we were writing the very first open access policy. It's three things and it's really important to always remember these three things. It's digital access. It's the free online access to the digital version uh, of a publication. And that comes with a machine readable uh, copyright license typically the Creative Commons license, so that we know what the reused rights are. And that version is archived properly uh, in a repository. And this is really important uh, because it's not just a case of putting up a PDF, retaining the copyright and giving people free access to read. That's not enough, that's not what we need. Data has a similar number of requirements, 
possibly the, the one difference there is that where we're talking about individual patient data, we need a managed form of access. There needs to be a data access committee so that we can ensure privacy um, uh, and confidentiality, but we can still enable the access. And so um, I think that the, the open science uh, agenda is shown on that slide. If we go to the next one, what I would like to say is, why does this matter? And this is just some of the things that WHO has been doing. And this really matters to you. So over the last six to seven months, I don't even know if we can count it, but WHO has developed and produced literally hundreds and hundreds of evidence-based guides in the six UN languages and in Spanish and in other languages too. And these are used to guide clinical practice. They're used to inform the public. They're used to inform country strategy. They're used for travel advice. They're used for things like identifying and promoting the correct use of the different diagnostics that are being used out there. So we need access, not just to the published output, but also to all of the, the background data and, and protocols. Coordination of R&D is really difficult, and that's why a number of years ago at WHO we created the R&D Observatory, and that is now currently trying to map the global COVID-19 research effort, and that's produced and updated weekly in a, in a database. But it's incredibly hard to get access to the research protocols, for research funders to release their data on what they're funding and, and where and how. And so we need a greater openness in that if we are to coordinate better. The International Clinical Trials Registry platform is able to demonstrate where clinical trials are taking place, at what stage, with which population groups. Again, it's essential right now, if we're gonna have any hope of coordinating the efforts around diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Within TDR, the group that I work mostly in, we're very focused around data and data sharing. And it's really important that we can actually get access right down to the patient level of data. And so we're working with some groups called Edo and Isara. We There is a 115,000 individual patient records from 48 countries collect together. And we are developing the governance structure around that to enable those data to be used and reused. And it's at that kind of scale that we may have a better uh, chance of answering some of these questions about risk factors, about the link between uh, heritage and, and disease. But we haven't forgotten other pandemics as well. We continue to work with Ebola and we have the Ebola database. And with that, we are also building capacity within researchers from those affected countries to understand data, to curate data, to use data uh, and undertake data analysis. So if you go to the next slide here, this isn't just a nice to have. This is what's happening right now. And this is access to preprints so these are research, research out, outputs prior to, to peer review, deposited in MedArchive. If we look back to this time, of, well, to July of last year, about 25,000 uses. As of April and May, uh, the left-hand scale is a log scale, there were 10 million uses. This was provided to me by uh, Theo, um, the uh, executive editor of BMJ. So this shows and this demonstrates people are using this material and they are using it uh, right now, and that's because we need the information right now. So if you just go to the next slide, my last slide. So what does the future hold and what do we need to do? Well, in my opinion, all public health is urgent. It just operates at different timescales. As we've already heard, more people will die of TB uh, during this pandemic, unfortunately, than of COVID-19. More, more women will die in childbirth. For every 100 people on the planet, 22, have some form of hypertension, but only four of them have any mechanism to manage it. So they're a huge, huge, huge agenda. And what I really hope is that we, we retain this spirit and effort to coordinate and collaborate uh, and make things more open once this pandemic, uh, once we're through this one, because we actually have the tools to do this, the internet, uh, but we, we are not able to maximize its use because of things like subscriptions and paywalls and, and the like. So we need to support preprints. We need to reward open science. We absolutely need to strip out of the scientific system the impact factor. It is a toxic measure. It provides completely perverse drivers. And we need to absolutely get it out of the system. And that means supporting the Declaration on Research Assessment, which is something we've signed up to. If we can get to there, then what we get is what I was talking about back in 2003, 
which is we need new open platforms. And they can link the publications, the data, the figures, the images, the comments across languages, across countries. And that's where you start to generate new knowledge. And hopefully that's where we'll get a bit closer to the objective, which is science for all. And uh, just finish on the, my last slide, otherwise my boss will, uh, will not, not forgive me for putting it across the public health message. Thank you, John Cool. Thank you very much, Gary. And I really like your slide number five. It's, uh, I, I fully subscribe to this. <laughs> Perhaps we can have immediately an intervention by uh, Samia Shafri Kadur from the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Tunisia, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Claude. It's really a very great pleasure for me to participate to this uh, webinar to celebrate the uh, International Day of uh, uh, Universal Access to Information. Uh, I am uh, General Director of Scientific Research. We can... Uh, okay. And uh, uh, I am also Rapporteur of the advisor, Open Science uh, Advisory Committee of uh, UNESCO. And it is my pleasure to present uh, the first uh, elements of the draft of uh, our committee and also a uh, response to questions addressed to Tunisia. Uh, so uh, next slide. Uh, so um, the advisory committee contributed to uh, preparing the first draft uh, that will be used by UNESCO to develop an international standard setting instrument for open science uh, to uh, present to the next uh, member states uh, meeting mm -hmm. uh, as a recommendation for open science of UNESCO. And I would say that we are in a complex uh, context uh, with I, I consider that we have three main elements. The first one is that we are in an interconnected environment and social economical challenges for the people in the world. And we have uh, these uh, special health issues like uh, COVID-19, but also a uh, big challenge uh, connected with uh, climate change, uh, food security, and so on. Uh, we feel now that really uh, science and technology can give uh, uh, solutions for these uh, challenges. And uh, the third point is that actually uh, the technology communication technologies are, uh, and information are very uh, key elements to accelerate the communication uh, in the world. And it's really this global interconnection that we should use to accelerate uh, human progress. We can move to the next slide. So uh, some key elements uh, concerning open science, the challenge. Science is a global common good and it should be accessible and bring benefit to all, as you, as you said. Uh, open science is, is a movement of transformation uh, of the practice of science and uh, um, to adapt changes and challenges to increase societal uh, impact of science. And I have to say in this context that developing countries like Tunisia, for example, uh, has some difficulties with this uh, change because we are moving, for example, for uh, publication from um, a business model in which we have to pay uh, libraries, we have to pay uh, publishers to access to, to read papers. And with open access uh, system, we have to pay to publish. So we have actually a change in the business model and it's difficult to, uh, to, manage, to manage when you don't have a big budget for publication. So it's a question open for the, the, uh, the discussion after. Uh, okay, so uh, we go back to the uh, importance of open science. I think that, of course, quality of science can be approved by this open collaborative way and inclusive way of, of working, of dealing with science. Uh, of course, a greater access to scientific outputs and inputs can improve the, the, the results of, uh, and the productivity of science, uh, uh, of scientific system by reducing the duplication costs and allowing more research on the same data so uh, can accelerate the, uh, the access to results. 
uh, of course, uh, open science means open access, open data, open sources, uh, open access to infrastructure, open evaluation, and so on. And also open engagement of uh, social actors uh, and this collective intelligence which can uh, promote and can give uh, uh, solutions for problem uh, more, uh, accelerate the access to these uh, solving problems. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, the uh, advisor uh, committee for open science proposes uh, this uh, in this draft that we should focus on core values and uh, on uh, guiding principles and we also propose area of actions. So, I just very briefly uh, say that core values are uh, very important. We should have collective benefits, equity, fairness, quality and integrity diversity and inclusiveness. Uh, the area of action, of course, we should promote common understanding of open science. Uh, and we can have different uh, diverse paths because in different countries, we sh should we have different contexts. Uh, we should, in, our, in developing countries particularly, develop uh, new policy, new uh, legal actions, uh, new regulation. To, to push uh, toward the open science, uh, open science. Uh, of course, uh, investing on open science infrastructure and services is very important, and also on uh, capacity building. And we can have also other uh, actions. It's just a uh, first uh, presentation of uh, these actions. Just to move to the other. Uh, Next, okay. So uh, concerning Tunisia, so what are the lessons uh, from COVID-19 pandemic in Tunisia? Uh, we, we have seen that during the pandemic, exceptional practice in the world with sharing data, platforms, uh, intellectual property to, for example, to construct health equipment and sharing tools. So this was very important, for example, for a country uh, like Tunisia, because uh, with co closed frontiers, uh, we, we had the responsibility to find solution locally uh, and it was really the opportunity to develop new collaboration between researchers, to develop new collaboration between research and industry using what we can share uh, by uh, what we can share by internet, data, platforms, solutions, tools. And uh, this is also was a new exercise for our researchers because Generally, we uh, collaborate with northern countries, and uh, it was really a, a good opportunity to collaborate inside Tunisia between uh, labs and the structure, which are generally in competition. Uh, also, uh, another lesson was uh, very important is that public health is a priority, and also the important role of science was really demonstrated. So uh, there was a really a solidarity to support Ministry of Health and Public Health, particularly with a financial support from enterprises, from civil society. Uh, and I hope it will continue because we need more and more support for uh, public health. Uh, international scientific collaboration are, uh, as I said, oriented uh, toward North issues. So now we are really we are funding national projects aligned to national priority to find local solutions. Um, and uh, we have uh, now a new project dealing with COVID-19, which are funded, and we are trying also to launch new practice, particularly sharing national data on COVID-19 and sharing also uh, solutions from different labs. So this is a new practice of science and I hope we will have a new, uh, this resilience, uh, the, in the, the, this resilience should uh, give us a new uh, practice of, uh, of science. So to conclude, uh, I would like to say that we have lessons, but we have to, to, uh, to take these lessons for the future. And uh, open science is really a big challenge, but you have to do a lot to don't have to pay more than before to access to publish and also to access to read publication. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Samia. Thank you very much for this in really interesting presentation. And just because you're moving a bit behind time, I'm immediately going to proceed with your permission to the next person who is Abel Packer, 
and who is going to talk to us from the perspective of a very important Latin American publication platform, uh, very much uh, involved with health issues in its early history before branching out, Cielo. So Abel, it's your, your turn. Thank you, uh, Jean-Claude. Thank you, UNESCO, for inviting me uh, to participate in, in this uh, commemoration of the International Day for Universal Access to Information. I <clears throat> use you uh, introduced uh, the challenge that a journal web platform have in terms of uh, contribution to knowledge construction and uh, equity access and uh, the challenge to overcome epistemic injustice requires to address cultural and the infrastructure asymmetries and to promote global inclusive scholarly communication flow. And of course, in the case of a journal, to produce quality journals. So I will share with you the experience in this regarding of the Cielo. Uh, Latin America is the region that proportionally publishes more in open access I need a reason, please, uh, that you click the lines. So uh, the historical uh, background uh, was uh, the uh, partnership of the National Science Council and the National Information System with United Nations agencies and the foundations. Uh, and uh, we had uh, the uh, experienced uh, of the FAPESP and the BRM partnership in 1998, 23 years ago, four years before uh, Budapest declaration, uh, the launching of Cielo, uh, which is uh, uh, among the open access pioneer. You know? And we are going now uh, to open science, which represents a new big challenge. Uh, next. So uh, please go ahead, the Hassan, please. Okay, Cielo program it free, uh, it has a, a, a publishing model that frames the publishing of a national collection uh, under, let's say, public policies, and uh, we uh, we. We have this, um, uh, let's say, let me get to the, the right slide here. So uh, the, the model is oriented to national collection, is fully decentralized, and it is becoming based on open science pra practices a fully networked operation and uh, trying to use the state of art in scholarly communication. We have today 17 countries, 1,200 journals, uh, 50K new documents per year, almost 1 million docs accumulated. And uh, according to the counter uh, methodology, 1.5 million downloads per day. Uh, we defined uh, uh, in the last three years, uh, or basically we approved when you have, when you celebrate Cielo 20 years, uh, the way to open science. So the, the idea is to use our experience with open access, which is based in public policy development of the national capacities and the infrastructure and the converge uh, uh, the different uh, players, national and the international. Uh, open science requiring, in the case of a journal uh, uh, production, a renewal of the role of the editors, reviewers, uh, authors, 
the indexes no, and the funding and the evaluation. So it's a cultural change and it needs uh, 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 effort to develop uh, learning and the capacity. So we already started a cello preprint uh, repository, which is working uh, very well. Uh, it, it, we prioritize the publishing of the COVID uh, uh, research. And the, uh, we, Cielo as a whole, already published about 2,000 articles on COVID-19 and the, about 400 uh, through the preprints. We start also Cielo data, so uh, journals will start to interoperate article with data. And uh, also we are starting options for opening peer review process, which is a big challenge also. And of course, stress uh, uh, interoperability. Uh, we uh, have uh, recommendations to UNESCO to consider open science as a global, continuous, inclusive information flow uh, which is uh, a way uh, to avoid unfair division, unfair splitting, unfair, uh, let's say, uh, divide of the uh, scientific communication. Open science and uh, communication infrastructures to be considered as global public goods. And uh, UNESCO to develop indicators of the inclusiveness of the open science policies, products, and the services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abel. Thank you very much for a good, very good presentation of the problems as seen from the Cielo perspective, Latin America uh, as well. We're going to move on now to Johan Rorik, who has become the public figure, more or less, of a, of a coalition S which of course express the very well-known, sometimes hotly debated plan S. Um, I think that there are quite a few things that Johan now can add to this discussion from that particular perspective, which gives <clears throat> a frontal role to uh, a very important partner, which until now has never been terribly foregrounded in open access discussions, I mean the funding agencies. So, Johan, it's your turn. Jean-Claude, um, I'm waiting for the slides to appear. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yes, I'm going to briefly present uh, Coalition S and Plan S. Coalition S is a global alliance of 23 organizations, research performing and research funding organizations, mostly funding organizations. Tomorrow we will be 25, so look out for the announcements tomorrow. Uh, plan S is uh, a plan based on 10 principles for open access, 10 very strong principles of open access, going from keeping copyright for, for researchers uh, to uh, uh, to uh, new uh, assessment principles for and uh, for and, and incentives following following DORA Declaration of San Francisco, um, the idea behind Plan S is, uh, as Jean Claude already mentioned, that in fact um, open access requirements would be uh, enshrined in the grant agreements that funders um, uh, contract with uh, researchers. And by enshrining these open access requirements in the open access uh, in the in the in the grant agreements, the funders use their funding as a driver for change from subscription to open access. What the funders want to do, what Coalition S wants to do, basically, is to have a systemic approach to achieving open access. I mean, we we think there is no one single silver bullet towards open access, and we want to support multiple roads to open access compliance. So that means gold open access, green, do, green open access, diamond open access, all the colors of the rainbow open access, as long as it is open access. Um, so all of our researchers starting in 21, in January 21, uh, with different timelines for different funders, but starting in January 21, we will require that all researchers receiving 
funds from coalition as, as in whole or in part, from coalition as partners in whole or in part, will have to, one way or another, publish all of their research results in open access. Um, the coalition also provides for op uh, su support for open access infrastructure where that is not yet uh, available. That is something that we are studying for the moment. We have also provided uh, a price transparency framework, namely we don't want to just throw money at the existing publishers, but we want to rekindle competition amongst the publishers and we want to pay a fair price for, uh, for open access publishing uh, services. And that's why we've launched the price transparency framework for which we are also going to provide uh, an infrastructure. And uh, finally, uh, there is a commitment to metrics that value the intrinsic merits of a research or output. So as uh, uh, Rob has already announced, we want to move away from the impact factor. We want to move away from quantitative metrics towards qualitative metrics in the evaluation of researchers who ask for grants. And that is already well underway. Uh, most of the funders, uh, most of our funders are now applying DORA principles in the selection of researchers. Uh, in my own view, that still needs to be rolled down towards universities, but, that, um, and, but clearly uh, the change is coming, uh, I believe, in that area as well. Next slide, please. Now, in a way, and many people here uh, around the, the virtual table have already said that COVID-19 is basically the best argument for open science. I mean, what I often say is, imagine the world if we had not had open science and open access and we had COVID-19. Imagine, for instance, embargoes of six and nine months or, or six, nine or 12 months in the, in the context of COVID-19. Um, we, we would never have been able to make such pro progress. And, at the same time, you know, which is a little bit of a contradiction, there's still more articles behind the paywall than, uh, than there are in open access, also about COVID-19. So, um, and what the publishers have provided us with, and let's not forget, is temporary open access, right? I mean, most of the big publishers have provided us temporary open access, saying very clearly, well, as soon as a solution is reached, we will close, we will close the wall again. This, of course, is, 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 is unacceptable. This is not something we, we, we should accept in any way. And of course, once you open the, the door, then the question really becomes, well, why would you restrict open access to COVID-19? Why not have all research in, in open access? I mean, is COVID-19 uh, uh, so much more special than any other disease like malaria or, or Ebola, like, like Rob mentioned. So I, I think the, the COVID-19 situation presents us with a unique opportunity. Namely, it, it really presents us with a kind of a dress rehearsal for present and future societal challenges. And the, the lessons we learn today about the situation should guide us for the future, because behind COVID-19, of course, there's societal challenges regarding uh, climate change uh, and the next, the, the, the next epidemic that, that rears its ugly head. So really the question is, if we don't solve, or if we don't move towards open access now, then we'll, we, when will we do it? When will we get our, when will we get our acts together? Um, the next slide, please. So I, I would like to end with a number of recommendations, uh, uh, as, as was asked actually by the number of recommendations that we have also already formulated for, for UNESCO. Um, uh, namely, there should be mandatory rules and, and policies and or laws um, that are needed towards to move towards open science and more open access and more open science. And we believe that the transition from subscription journals to open access journals must be accelerated. Uh, we are trying to do that through our policies. Uh, we are trying to do that in a relatively limited framework with Coalition S. And of course, we should create incentives for researchers, not only in, uh, to the funders, but also in universities, incentives for researchers to share their outputs and collaborate rather than compete. This is also something that Rob already said, but it bears repeating. We can't repeat it enough, I believe. The incentive system has to change completely for this to be, to be, to be possible. So we need to be inventive and creative in, in that area. Um, of course, the additional support is needed. Additional worldwide support is needed for open access and for open science infrastructure, especially in low and middle income countries. And we are currently also in coalition as trying to see how we can do this in response to, um, to Jean-Claude's uh, question uh, before is how can we do that? Well, that, that, 
that there are challenges for this, of course, because a, a number of the funders, uh, the remit of uh, a, a number of funders is a national remit. So it's very hard for them sometimes to operate on an, on an international level. So again, this is something that we'll, we will have to investigate. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a necessarily a natural limit, but it is definitely so, uh, one that we need to take into account uh, for a researcher from, uh, 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 for, let's say, a uh, national funder from the Netherlands. It's, it's, it's not really uh, easy to justify a payment for a researcher uh, uh, from, uh, let's say, Colombia, right? Uh, because the, the, there is a national remit uh, that, that's, that such funders have. So we need to be creative in that area as well. How do we support uh, international infrastructure uh, uh, given, given these, uh, these national limits? Finally, uh, therefore, I would like to conclude on the, on the note that international collaboration is absolutely needed. And that, that uh, in the international co collaboration, in my view, needs to be focused not on one single bu bullet, not on one single idea, but on a number of systemic ideas and policies that interlock and that jointly deliver the promises of uh, open science and open access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. In re with regard to the international limits to national funding agencies, it's all the more interesting that if you look at the history of scientific publishing, you see that the commercial publishers obtained their dominant position after the Second World War by being international as against the national uh, scientific associations, scientific organizations that used to be the main publishers of science in various countries. And we are facing again this kind of problem now with a different level of organization. So the, the question of an international science, which could be really uh, governed internationally uh, in a public way as against the multinational um, commercial ambitions of the commercial publishers is really, I think, at the heart of the question. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that UNESCO could play a central role in this, in this debate. Uh, I fully agree. Such an international <laughs> response, if I yeah, may. I fully agree. I fully agree. Well, this leads us again to this notion of journals and platforms. And now we have a second platform coming online with Ariana from Redalic in Latin America. Uh, I don't know if she's going to put the problem in terms of journals and platforms, but I, I use the, the uh, opportunity of re, re foregrounding this particular issue as I give the floor now, whatever the floor may be virtually, uh, as, as I give the floor to uh, Ariana. Your turn, Ariana. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored to share this panel with all of uh, all of you. Um, well, my presentation, please. Oh, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. I'd like to start by highlighting um, that there's a lively scholarly communication system uh, beyond the so-called mainstream circuit, uh, so, which is uh, neither peripheral nor marginal, as uh, sometimes it is believed. Sometimes it is believed that uh, there's one mainstream circuit or mainstream science, but, but it, it is not. Uh, we should remind ourselves that, um, let's say, the map is not the territory when mainstream science is defined. For example, let's have a look to the map from the Red Alix Vantage Point. Since the COVID-19 pandemic started, in Red Alix, 25 articles have been published by more than 500 journals indexed by Red Alix. All of them published by uh, academic institutions, more than 300 universities from 22 countries, and authored by thousands of researchers from around the world. Uh, next slide, please. 11 million uh, uh, unique users have been attended during uh, this six month period of the pandemic uh, uh, by Redalic, with uh, 60 million article downloads. More than 100 articles uh, on COVID-19 have been published from 400 authors from different countries. Uh, and here, please note that, for example, The Lancet, 
this uh, journal from Elsevier uh, has published uh, 146 articles I checked uh, last night on COVID-19 on this journal. And this particular journal charges a fee for authors of, of 5,000 euros. Just to put it in context, a Latin American researcher could have to spend all or a large part of his research budget only on the publication phase. Uh, he could run out of resources for research, for example. And please do not misunderstand this point. I know there are payment exceptions, uh, but this is not about money. This is about epistemic justice. This is about inclusion. Uh, this is about a few controlling and granting access to the rest. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the scholarly communication system I described, the one that uh, has been run by Latin American institutions and platforms, uh, shows that an unrestricted ecosystem for authors and readers can be achieved. Uh, it is not only feasible, but it, it is efficient, it is effective, and it promotes diversity, inclusion, and, for example, multilingualism, uh, where the science as public good approach prevails with academic institutions as the owners of the means and processes, which is a condition that enables universities and research entities to control and shape the, the future of them, the future of scholarly communication, uh, with immediate uh, APC-free open access naturally achieved. No intermediation of agreements are needed. Uh, with a strong public investment in a cooperative uh, and creative distribution of costs. Uh, next, please. So from our perspective, four dimensions need to be addressed to leverage open science, to accelerate the development of science, and to respond better to the uh, contingencies uh, that affect our current society, like the one we are leading today. Uh, and are the evolution of current research assessment, as uh, the other panelists uh, also highlighted, the continuous improvement on quality and standards, and um, a, the, to keep innovative web technologies uh, such as semantics or artificial intelligence a chance to show uh, its capabilities at reaching organic visibility. So we can, uh, as a society, we can move away from the, you know, the proprietary uh, prestige system that we are uh, uh, locked in today. Uh, and a chance as well to contribute in the sustainability of non-commercial open science, uh, 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 probably uh, with uh, production cost savings, promoting credible participation, uh, and having uh, advanced let's say, a structuring of information that enable us to link uh, knowledge uh, between platforms and between journals and other media. So uh, finally, just to mention some takeaways, um, it is possible to run journal publishing on a not-for-profit basis. In this approach, everyone gets benefit from everyone's investment. However, uh, however, it is a model with challenges, of course, with vulnerabilities, of course, with risks, and uh, it needs to be supported as well. That is why Amelika and Redalik are focused on this particular model. So we have uh, uh, to come back um, to the and to rethink to the purpose of open access and open science because the path we already uh, walked is not giving us the expected results worldwide. Coming back to the confusion of the map and the territory, we should question on which map are we willing to base the future of open science. And UNESCO has a, here a very important role. Perhaps it could be a good idea to have a more comprehensive understanding of the territory to provide better conditions for science to develop its potential in solving the big problems that we face today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ariana. And again, I think we see the, this question of inclusiveness in science, which I've raised myself with the issue, what kind of access do we want? And that access is not just access to reading, but also access to framing the questions, publishing and evaluating without perhaps going through the kinds of tools that traditionally 
we have uh, used uh, with ill effect. I'm uh, referring, of course, to the role that we do, the role we, um, we leave uh, journals play through their rankings and the impact factor, which has been already criticized by a number of people in this panel. Um, I really think personally, before I give my the, the word to, to Glenn, I really think personally that the journal is just an artifact of the uh, printing period of communication. With the digital world we are now in, we have to reevaluate whether we want journals to be the way they used to be. If we want journals, what should they do? What are they? What should they represent? We don't ask those questions enough as we move into the digital age. But perhaps Glenn will tell us more about these kinds of things because he asked the last position in order to reflect more synthetically about uh, everybody, uh, everybody else's thoughts. So Glenn, it's your turn. Thank you, Jean-Claude. As I'm waiting for my slides to come up, uh, I'll just say thank you. Uh, thank you to UNESCO for organizing this. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, thank you to the panelists and uh, looking through the participant lists. Thank you to, to, the, to the many people um, involved in this call today who have been involved for a long time in uh, helping <clears throat> develop open science and the future of open access. Um, these actions obviously have, have pre long predated uh, the COVID crisis and uh, the world owes you a debt uh, of gratitude for all your work. Uh, next slide, please. I think we're, oh, no, back one. <laughs> back one, please. Thank you. Uh, we're all agreed that, that open can help. Um, there, there's no doubt about this. And um, the people involved in OSI, and, and there are some 450 uh, individuals representing 250 institutions, 28 countries, 20 stakeholder groups. Um, that's our common ground. We're all agreed that uh, we need to find a way to make open uh, work for us and work better. Uh, next slide, please. And the question is how? Um, I think it, it's difficult to, to capture all of OSI's diverse opinions in, in one single statement, but I think uh, it might be accurate to say that, that we're trying to be aspirational, uh, but also grounded in our approach. So it's, it's, we, we have to temper our enthusiasm, I guess, uh, in this period when we say that things like uh, uh, preprints are going to play an important role in the future. Um, we need to realize uh, that this, this may be true, but uh, preprints at, at the moment uh, constitute only a small fraction of what's being published, somewhere on the order of 3%. Um, if this grows and becomes the norm, uh, then what kinds of challenges does this present? Uh, when we say that uh, the current crisis, the, the rate at which things are getting published today, uh, shows that publishing can move faster, uh, that's true. But we also have to be mindful of the stresses that this is that this current pace is, is putting on the cur current system. Uh, attention is being diverted from other issues. Costs are high, possibly not sustainable without additional costs to the systems. Uh, our traditional models of peer review are. are breaking they're just not sustainable um, at this level so do we want to reinvent peer review or, or, or rethink what we need from uh, research evaluation uh, next slide please and more fundamentally if we take a step back we have to ask ourselves whether open self or open science by itself uh, is going to produce better science and, and the answer really is no. Um, there's overlap um, between open science and better science. So issues of integrity, for example, include whether the analysis is done properly, uh, whether the uh, conclusions are objective, whether there's a well, you know, lack of conflict, no plagiarism and so forth. Open science can help with these things and we need to focus on those issues of overlap uh, because there's a real potential for open science to, to, to be of great benefit, but clearly, you know, Closed science is not unreliable or un, uh, lacks integrity, and not all open science is is uh, reliable and in high integrity. Uh, next slide, please. And in fact, taking a step further back uh, in the Venn diagram of problems facing scholarly communication, open solutions uh, may 
may help with some of these things, may not. Uh, there's, there's so many things, uh, the culture of communication and academia, uh, impact factors, as has been mentioned, uh, the issue of equity and access, um, how funders uh, determine what they're going to fund, uh, the issue of public policy. Open solutions can play an important role in this, but by themselves, focusing solely on open solutions isn't going to help us address uh, all of the challenges that currently face research publishing and communication. Next slide, please. And this is why in OSI, we've been looking at all of the challenges that are related to open research, not just open and how they interact. Uh, you might say that open is just a means to an end and uh, not our end goal. And our common end goal is, is what's fascinating. If we can think of this more in terms of working together, as uh, so many of you have already um, espoused, working together um, to help improve science and help improve the value of science to society. That's a goal that we can all agree on uh, rather than focusing simply on open. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for us, the future of research um, can be framed like this, and open is a critically important uh, pillar in this. Uh, one pillar is that science and society are going to benefit from open done right. Uh, second pillar is that successful solutions, as uh, so many of you have already said, uh, is, is going to require broad collaboration. A third pillar is that connected issues, as uh, that previous diagram showed, uh, need to be addressed. And then a fourth pillar is that open isn't a singular outcome, but it's a spectrum of outcomes. And I've included a, a diagram to that effect in the annex. Uh, next slide, please. So if we can dream big uh, about the future of open, but at the same time also work together and work smartly and practically toward open solutions, uh, we can increase the amount of open in the world starting today by working on our common ground solutions to the most pressing issues, tackling tougher issues uh, over time, like the impact factor and, and the promotion and tenure system. And then, dot, 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 next slide, please. We can reach what uh, we call an open renaissance. And, and this, is, this is where it gets really exciting, right? We're, open science becomes the default standard for the world, where it's clearly defined and supported, open solutions are robust and broad and inclusive and scalable. Almost all science information is discoverable. Uh, solutions for the humanities are built in. Let's not forget about the humanities. Uh, all these connected issues that uh, we diagrammed earlier here are, are aligned or, or rather are resolved. Incentives are aligned. Um, I think it was Samia who mentioned incentives. It's we, we, we need to, if we get to that point, then we can start to see uh, the full potential of open starting to be realized where the research uh, ecosystem grows exponentially more powerful than it is today because we have the data, things are connected, um, the incentives are aligned and science can start to surpass the value that it has today for both science and for society. Next slide, please. So we were asked to provide uh, our, our wish list of what UNESCO could then do uh, to affect this future. Uh, there are three items. Uh, number one is to improve our understanding of the open space. Uh, questions like, uh, what do researchers want and need? Uh, what gatekeeping mechanisms do we, do we need in science? How can we eliminate the influence of the impact factor? Um, what outcomes, uh, what open outcomes work best and where. Uh, number two is to think strategically. What, what are we trying to solve with open anyway? Uh, what can open solve? What should it solve? Uh, so rather than debating about exactly what kinds of open we need going forward, uh, let's, let's look at the big picture and figure out what we're trying to do. And item number three would be to work collaboratively as many of you have mentioned, and, and to work boldly, um, not just on COVID, but on issues like climate change and, and neglected diseases. Uh, 
and, and including building infrastructure uh, and, and not just the, the modest kinds of inf infrastructure, but the, the bold kinds of in infrastructure that, that, uh, that Rob had mentioned that can really help us um, get to a future where science is being used in ways that we don't even imagine today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And then if you could just skip through these next two, the, there's uh, on these next two slides, there's uh, some of the COVID related research, research that's happening, um, the research communication improvements rather that are happening today. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the communication improvements that are still needed. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the uh, open spectrum that I mentioned earlier. These slides will be available from UNESCO. I don't want to spend time here talking about them. Uh, and next slide, please. And that's it. So thank you very much. Um, there's my contact information if you have any questions. Um, back to you, Jean-Claude. Thank you very much, Glenn. Well, I'm looking at the time uh, that we have, and we have about 20 minutes left. In the original plan we had, I was supposed to have something like 47 minutes for questions among each other and then questions from the audience. What I propose we do to finish this uh, session is perhaps go through a very simple exercise with each member of the panel. And that exercise will be to issue quickly a one sentence recommendation to UNESCO, each one of you gives one, one recommendation, an action line to UNESCO. Do the following. This is what I think is the most important. One line, one sentence. And then hopefully, if you stick to that one line, one sentence rule, uh, we will have a few minutes to open up uh, questions from the audience. I believe that in the Q&A um, slot on the screen, there are already 22 uh, interventions that I see on my screen. So that, that uh, we should answer to at least some of these things. So I'll start right away with Rob and say, Rob, what's your recommendation to UNESCO? So I think their open access policy is good on publications. I think we now need to look at data and how we actually share data and particularly the ethics and governance frameworks around sharing individual patient data. Thank you, Rob, beautiful. Samia? Okay. Uh, I Open access, uh, open science uh, should be uh, equivalent to quality, high quality of uh, science, and we should we take care about the, this equation. Uh, Thank you. I think I, I, I'll say a word afterwards, but I think you're right on the button with this question. It's so central, so very central. Uh, Abel? Yes, um, my proposal recommendation to UNESCO is to develop a system of the indicators of the inclusiveness of the open science policies, products, and the services. That would be a kind of a global uh, framework or principles towards the development of the open science policies, products, and the services. Thank you, Abel. Johan? I have only one recommendation, join Coalition S. <laughs> That's hardly partisan. <laughs> well, I mean, I think we can achieve great things together. Uh, I mean, World Health Organization has already joined. I think UNESCO can help us achieve a, a more global perspective on uh, the policies that we are currently enacting. And I think we sorely need that. Johan, you're a formidable champion for coalitionists. <laughs> um, Ariana. Ariana. Uh, well, I, I may ask UNESCO, um, the term indecision on and, and response in support of the open science to enable a systemic uh, change based on principles and lessons learned of what or what or what uh, have already worked and what uh, what we have been witnessing that that doesn't. 
Thank you, Ariana. And Glenn, can you summarize all your slides in one sentence? <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, to embrace uh, the diversity of perspectives in this space um, and work together on truly global solutions that work for everyone everywhere. Thank you, thank you, all of you. I would add my own my own sort of recommendation, of doing um, uh, sitting on top of all the ones I heard. I, I'm really concerned about the issue of how to have an open system that also includes quality concerns and inclusiveness. And I think if we could work, if UNESCO could really work on those two issues and free us from the way things have been done in the recent past with judging quality through journal rankings, for example, which leads nowhere, and by having a system which essentially excludes three quarters of humanity from raising important questions in the, the scientific program of research all over the planet, I think we'll have made a big step forward. Now we have 15 minutes left there. By the way, my apologies, but that's the prerogative of the chair. I can sort of perorate like this on top of my chair and just tell people that's the way I think. But <laughs> so my apologies for this tone, but um, it's uh, I, I'm, I'm pressed for time. We have 15 minutes now. I'm going to turn to Banu now because I think I'm going to help, need the help of his team and, uh, and, uh, and uh, his uh, co-workers to select the questions that they think have been most interesting from the public. Is, am I doing the right thing, Banu? By, uh, yes, correct. Back to correct. You. Okay, um, I think you know, one of the first uh, uh, question that is for you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, so someone you know, asked you, you know, on national policies, especially in the southern part of the world, uh, especially Tunisia, which encourages scientists to publish by taking into account only articles published in the Journal of GCR, um, Clarivet Ranking, Quartiles of Schemago Ranking, leaving out open access journal. So this is like you know, a very systemic you know, question he asked. Uh, and it looks like you know, this pro problem you know, persists more in developing countries and uh, in, in the global south than in the north. So what will be your solution for this? So anyone who wants to jump in, go ahead, okay? I think I Abel or uh, Diana will be the best person to go. Okay. Hello? <laughs> okay, I, I can start to just to make some response because now actually we need a new policy for open science for publication. Uh, the, the case of Tunisia, of course, now we have to, we have rules for career promotion for PhD uh, um, uh, acceptance uh, of, uh, of thesis. So we need a criteria of quality. So now it is what we have, but uh, that's why I, I said we need uh, criteria of quality for open science and we will the ministry will be able to move to a transition to a new policy including open science open uh, open access journals I, I feel that we, we would like to to do this uh, transition but it's difficult to to have a a, a right and fair uh, way to uh, to evaluate the publication of scientists this is my concern okay. Right. Do we want to evaluate the publications of the scientists or evaluate their work? You, you understand the distinction? Yes, yes, there is a distinction, but sometimes we need to evaluate the publication uh, as a Why? way to... Why? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a big question. I, 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 I agree. I agree it's a big question. The evaluation is a big question. Could we recommend perhaps UNESCO to really do and make an effort to establish a, a some working group and study this yeah. issue of evaluating the quality of the research in order to help open science and move in the direction that Glenn was uh, essentially adumbrating in his own presentation? Yes, I completely agree. It could be a, a very uh, a, a important recommendation to UNESCO, yes. It will be a big help. And could the uh, 
funding agencies. Johan, could the funding agencies uh, work collaboratively to, to toward that kind of effort? Yes, of course. I think they definitely could, but they are they already are. Um, yeah, exactly. as, I, as I said before, I mean, the, the, the experts in coalition as which represent actually the various experts within uh, the, the participating organizations have have a kind of collaborative um, uh, working group in which they share information and they share specifically information, for instance, about um, uh, uh, as we speak, actually, about how, how to sanction uh, researchers who don't comply with the open access policy, uh, exchanging views on that. But not only on sanctioning, but really before all, many also about quality evaluation. How, how do we move forward uh, in uh, evaluating researchers um, when they apply for a grant? Uh, for exactly example, one of the things that many, many of the many uh, funders have adopted is uh, the, this model whereby, which was pioneered in Harvard, I believe, that, that, you know, you just submit five publications and you say why they are your best publications, and that is being evaluated instead of your list of publications. Right. So basically, you, more, you move towards the evaluation of contents, and, of, of, and you move towards the evaluation of the self-evaluation of the researcher. Which, which is a much more interesting process than just say, oh, this researcher has published uh, 55 publications and is therefore better than that, that the, other, the other researcher who has only published 54 publications, which is, of course, completely ridiculous, right? Yeah. But, which is something that we have been doing for years and it has become worse. So that needs to change. And that is something that is already being done amongst the funders and exchanging the best practices, as, as Rob actually can also... Uh, yeah. Can I just, just one thing I'd like to say, imagine this, and this is why the impact factor makes me so mad. Basically, you give out the gold medals to the race participants before they've even run the race. OK, they've just all they've done is been published in a journal. Nobody knows whether a paper subsequently will be highly impactful or significant or whatever. Right. And that's why the impact factor is such a toxic measure. It needs to be really got rid of. And it has a double edged sword as well. We've seen it recently with the hydroxychloroquine papers in Lancet, New England Journal, right? Because they were in those journals, they received huge amounts of interest, but they were subsequently and very quickly shown to be very badly done. The MM, the triple MR vaccine, right? The, the albatross around the Lancet's neck, okay? That is still quoted, that's a fraudulent paper, but still quoted today. And this is the basis of the anti-vax program, right? So this whole idea that you uh, evaluate a paper on the day of its publication is complete nonsense. And that's why I think preprints, previously preprints were not considered particularly the right way to go in the medical sciences. But I think one of the good things about uh, this pandemic, if there is, is, you can say there is a good thing, is that we've seen the value of publish first and peer review after, and then subsequently, and this is, I think, a role either for UNESCO or the learning societies, is put the quality stamp on once the impact has been realized, not at the start. That's ridiculous. It's like giving the gold medal just for turning up for a race. And I think we, should, we need to move away from that. Yes, and you, Gary. Yeah. I would like to add, if I may, uh, Jean-Claude, yes. uh, that yeah. I, I, I see that platforms have an important role to play here in, in, in this context, because platforms can provide this space for cooperation instead for competition. So journals and content can be or are not supposed to be ranked, but are supposed to be connected in order to find uh, this uh, uh, fabric of knowledge and to uh, locate the, uh, the impact of a researcher in this in this network, this inner network that knowledge can be uh, uh, built. So uh, I think platforms have an important role, in, especially non-for-profit platforms, non-commercial platforms, in reshaping the contents or, or the spaces uh, that we have today. Yeah, and uh, to just for perhaps conclude on this particular question, it seems to me that trying to approach the issue of evaluation especially when you have platforms through journals and their rankings, rather than taking journals as reflections of communities with no reference to quality inherently, it's just a community. I think that, that, um, that sort of, uh, of evolution could help us get away from the impact factor 
and the sort of problems that Terry outlined very, very clearly a few minutes ago and make us move in a more inclusive and a more, a more open science for uh, the next few decades with the urgent problems that we, we will have to face, all of us. Jean-Claude, if, if I may, uh, sorry to step on your sentence there. Uh, I, I think, though, it's important for us to be realistic in this, and this is what one of my slides was, was suggesting. We're not going to eliminate evaluations of quality and rank simply by making everything open. This is a more systemic issue. It may have something to do with the impact factor. Uh, maybe we evaluate um, individual articles instead of journals and so forth, but there will still be researchers will still flock to uh, platforms and journals or, or whatever it may be that they perceive to be of higher quality. And that's just competition in the system. And that's, and that's healthy. That helps drive improvement, yeah, innovation, and so healthy. forth. It is healthy if the competition is really a competition for quality. But when it's a co also a competition for market shares, you have two agendas you know, in the same movement which create a lot of noise and a lot of, of distortions in the process. And but, I think that's what we're facing. Yeah. If, if I may, I mean, um, what, what Rob said about pre-publication or post-publication peer review can, can exactly create that space. I mean, already solutions are being developed for that. You know, you first publish and then the, the paper attracts uh, reviewers and it's the reviewers who are of high quality and who assess the quality of the of the of the article before it is even published. And then you get, uh, on top of that, you get an overlay journal, an overlay journal that will then select the best, the best papers as a result of the quality of the reviews that is, that, that is being attributed. So basically what you get is a bottom-up system that mm -hmm. where, where quality is selected from the bottom up rather than, than from the top down, if you see what I mean. Exactly. And and that, that, that would be a brilliant that would be a brilliant outcome, but we're not we're not there yet. No, right. but this is what we were suggesting in two thousand and three. Yeah. So uh, we're not waiting another fifteen years for it to come through. We're making recommendations <laughs> to UNESCO right now, remember. So we could say to UNESCO these are the kinds of roadmaps we're thinking about, and you might want to put some working groups developing that much more closely. We're not going to do it in the next two minutes that we are left with uh, uh, with this meeting. But I think we've, we've, hit, we've hit the nail on the most important question, the distortion of science, the, 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 what I call the epistemic injustice, as well as the wrong, the wrong publications coming to the fore because of a system of competition, which is based on the wrong entities, namely, commercial journals that compete for market shares at the same time. You're, you end up with a whole mess of, of issues there. Banu, I'm passing back the, the, the floor to you to see what you want to do at this point. We have one, one and okay. a half. Minutes. I, I have got uh, one very interesting observation to make that uh, we right. have received you know, something 30 questions in total. And, and unfortunately, or fortunately, half of these questions are something, you know, that uh, um, based on which uh, the entire debate of open access was started, you know, some 20, 20 years ago. We are still talking about impact factor. We are still talking about, you know, uh, the concern for, uh, for, for, for uh, Global South. We are still talking about quality. We are still talking about, you know, how to pay for the services. We are still talking about APC. So what are the base steps that we have taken in the last um, maybe uh, 20 years of our discussion on open access? Uh, what has really happened? Can the panelists you know, actually conclude in one sentence what we have done? And, uh, and they have already said, you know, where we can go from here. For that one, you know, I'll be writing to everyone and I'll be inviting, you know, if, uh, of course, you know, we, we, we are more than willing to uh, formulate small, you know, expert group to take this uh, uh, agenda forward. Uh, quite interestingly, I, I'm reading a question from uh, Joy Sogburn, you know, who is a great, you know, like collaborator and, and, uh, and, and partner. She actually said that what are the first concrete steps you know, we should take? You know, this is uh, so we are essentially still at square one. We have not even, you know, moved forward. So what, have, what has happened in the last uh, 20 years? Uh, maybe, you know, like uh, the, the, the panelists could summarize their concern in one sentence. And maybe, uh, uh, Jean-Claude, you can uh, some, uh, like, close the session 
And there is a small video that we want to show, you know, before uh, that uh, the, the session is closed. And a, uh, there is a question that will appear in your uh, screen, which you'll have to answer. How much more time do we have, Manu? Uh, we have got about uh, two, three, four, five minutes, you know, uh, maybe, you know, 30 seconds each, you know, and everybody takes uh, that. What we have achieved, you know, thus far. Right. Maybe, you know, we'll go take the same, you know, like Rob will start and we go yeah, from yeah. there to Shami. I mean, it's it's easy to feel defeatist and listening to Glenn, it's like, wow, we need another 15 years before we actually even go anywhere. But when I, if I go back to when I was at Wellcome Trust in the year 2000 and we were talking about open access, this was like brand new. There was nothing out there. We had the Public Library of Science Declaration, that was it. If I now look back, we have hundreds and hundreds of open access journals that are viable and publishing. All new journals that come online these days are open access. We have, in my own area, in TDR, more than 85% of all the research we publish is open access. We have new platforms, new ways of publishing, like F1000. We have new repositories, like the European PubMed Central. So there's a huge amount has been achieved. What is happening in Latin America needs to be preserved, that's for sure, because that was the situation in Europe and North America in the 1960s until Pergamon Press and Robert Maxwell and Elsevier got their hands on it and destroyed the system with this commercial nonsense that we now are still trying to get rid of. We can go back to that. We don't, we don't have to worry. And the biggest change is the internet. I and mean, if we can if we can realize the full potential of the internet, as I was talking about, then it's relatively easy to do. We can distribute information for marginal costs, no cost, uh, and those types of things, and then concentrate on things that matter, which is what John Claude was saying, which is access. How do people who don't have access to the internet have access to this material? How do we build that kind of infrastructure? Thank you. Uh, Samia, thirty seconds. <laughs> okay, just uh, probably I can I can say that we should have to share good experience from other countries to make uh, policies and to to uh, try to find a way uh, to go faster to open science. Thank you, thank you, Abel. Abel, thirty seconds. Thank you, thank you, Jean Claude. Thank you. Uh, I think we we have uh, let's say comprehensive understanding and the recommendation. So I am uh, let's say happy with the perspectives of open science in the sense that it will bring more uh, contributions than risks uh, as uh, we uh, thought in the beginning. So the resistance to open science will uh, progressively uh, be overcome and we will have, let's say, better uh, access, better uh, uh, journals, better data and uh, uh, better uh, capacity to use uh, scientific knowledge. Thank you, Abel. Thank you. Johan? I completely subscribe to what Rob has been saying. Uh, first of all, that's, that's, that's uh, easy. Uh, the other thing is that I think uh, the realization in, has, has now really taken hold, I think, that uh, the subscription system is completely antiquated and on, on its way out. I mean, we are in a transition, whether we, whether we fully realize it or not. Uh, all, the, all the indicators are in that direction. The funders are sus subscribing to it even. Uh, the, I mean, we should get much more actors on board, of course. Libraries should be more active, I think, than, than they are. But it's very clear where we're going. Um, the, the only question is, how do we organize this globally? And how do we organize this globally in a fair way? How do we all uh, contribute to the cost of uh, academic publishing in a way that is fair uh, and, uh, and tied to uh, 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 purchasing parity, for instance. Uh, that, that is certainly not realized yet. And that is something that we all need to work on. Thank you, Johan. Ariana? Thank you, Jan-Claude. Uh, well, uh, we believe that 
Latin America have showed uh, this complex ecosystem that sustain community-led academia and scholarly communications. But we are very concerned uh, uh, about this ecosystem interacting with the commercial one where science is seen as a commodity because it's very difficult to survive. It's, we are struggling to survive in this uh, very voracious competition with uh, the commercial uh, the scholarly communication strategies where the big uh, uh, funding flows are directed to this other ecosystem and our ecosystem is suffering from degradation uh, every day. So we, if we continue like uh, we are doing today, we are ending up in maybe 20 years with the same, um, with the same problems as uh, many other countries are suffering today. So we have to be very coordinated together, all together regions and platforms in order to preserve what we know, what it is good for science. Thank you, Ariana. And Glenn? I think to answer Bonnie's question, they, the last 20 years have uh, shown a tremendous explosion um, of open, uh, not necessarily in an uptake, but in uh, tools, activity, participants, uh, awareness, uh, realization of the need and the potential for open. Um, I think that we found in OSI that uh, there's a tremendous amount of common ground in this space, common ground between uh, the different actors and their interests um, coming at open science from so many different angles. Uh, the future is going to depend on us coming together on our common ground uh, to work together on these uh, pressing needs. Thank you. Uh, to conclude myself, and I guess this will be the concluding words of this meeting, am I right, Banu? Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, I would like to echo in effect what Rob said at one point, which leads us to a sort of uh, interesting paradox. Latin America right now with Jean Claude, the we don't hear you. And have, pardon me? No, it's, no, no, it's, uh, it's Latin America uh, and platforms in a, in a very interesting way have maintained against all odds what has been destroyed in North America and Europe by the, uh, the advent of the Maxwells of the world and the Pergamon Press and the rest of it. And it's, uh, it's, it could be that the open access movement that started like a sleepwalking exercise in the late 90s, as Abel reminded us in the Budapest Initiative in 2002, was really an attempt to uh, find a way with the digitization to recreate the community base, the scientific association base, the, uh, the sort of international cooperation and, and circulation of information that dominated all of science since the 19th century. So in a very funny way, perhaps the best way to the future would be to bring back in some fashion an international collaboration of national institutions, scientific associations, funding agencies, research institutions to form together the fabric and the weaving of a communication system that would not be completely um, penetrated by other concerns such as bottom lines, profit seeking, market share seeking, and the rest of it. So what I would suggest as, an, as, a, as a big plan to work forward for UNESCO is to link how that vision I just laid out could be fed into and built by a really a concern for a complete reworking of how pe things are evaluated in science. Because somewhere, I think somehow, the evaluation system of science has been hijacked by commercial interests. And I think that's where it should be. It should start to be corrected again nowadays. So that would be my concluding words here for this meeting. Thank you very much for, I think, a rather interesting and well uh, or, uh, designed system of communication, which has allowed voices to be heard and uh, perhaps the possibility of saying things that we don't hear all that often in many other meetings we go to uh, regarding open access, open science and um, the like. So thank you for thank you to all of you and I hope to meet all of you again 
soon in the near future. Bye bye. Thank you, Jean Claude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Are we okay, okay. now? Well done, John Claude. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Um, yeah, bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, indeed. This was the first time I shared such a meeting with Zoom, and then I, might, I must say, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. You did well, John Claude. You did well. You did fantastic. Yeah. No, well, thank you, but I'm not sure. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I did my I did my best.